Thank you. Well, let's pray together. Gentlemen, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Father, we walk by faith. We know that. We know that you have saved us by your grace and through the work of Christ upon the cross, and you've set us free from the power of sin, the control of sin over us, and and yet we have to admit there's still a daily struggle that we all face, a spiritual battle. And we know tomorrow that Satan will be seeking to hinder us, discourage us, defeat us, detour us. So I pray tonight you would come and help us begin to understand this spiritual battle that we all are in and help us to understand its impact for our lives and what it means for tomorrow, please. Come, because unless you come and speak, Lord, nothing's going to happen. So I ask you to come, and as you do, may the glory and praise be to your name and in Christ. Amen. Well, if you've been coming on Wednesday nights, we've been working our way through uh, the life of Moses, and before the rapture, we're going to try and get it done. We'll see. But we finished just a short, what, a couple weeks ago, looking at the Israelites and their battle with Amalek. And and I keep hearing a ringing. Is that just me? But I can really hear it strongly. It's got to be Satan. Just kidding. Can you hear it or is it just me? I am really hearing it coming at me. It's the AC. Let's have some heat then. And I thought we would take a break for a little bit and look at our spiritual battle. The Israelites may have faced Amalek, but we face a spiritual battle with Satan. And we have two runners tonight. If you have a question, a comment you want to make, they will come to you. But for right now, you don't need to get up for this one. Just when you hear that whole sense of a spiritual battle with Satan, just real short answer is what comes to mind. Do you know what I mean? We're in a spiritual battle. We're going to look at it in just a little bit. But what comes to mind when you think of Satan or you think of that spiritual battle? Just throw them out real quick. The armor of God. The armor of God. And we're going to look at that armor. Tom? Distractions. In the back. Distractions. Temptations. Conflict. Conflict. What else comes to mind? People and fiery darts. We're going to look at those. And people. Who said people? Are you... you Pointing at anybody in particular for that in here, or just? Okay. All right. What else, Holly? I'm sorry? Hindrances. Yes, we're going to look at how he hinders us at times. Yes. Well, we could go on and on because this is a very real battle, and, and we know, in many ways, we know a lot about this spiritual battle, but I thought we would take a look at it. We're not going to go in depth on it, In fact, I I made my mind we were going to go in depth, and I added something, and I added something more, and it's a little more in depth than what I thought. But it's not a long study on this battle with Satan, but I just thought we'd look at it. I want us to help us understand this battle and the fact that it exists and a little bit about it. To do that, let me tell you, remind you of my story. I'm not going to take a long time with my story but just to help us understand the reality of that battle. I graduated from seminary, went back to my home church in Ohio, did a a year's internship there, and then went to pastor a church called Valley View Village Church in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, beautiful setting, southern suburb of Cleveland. Small church, about 75 people, and, and we begin to grow. We begin to reach out to an area called Garfield Heights, which is right next to it. And you don't know anything about that area or that whole area, but... Um, Garfield Heights has a satanic church that they meet in a home, and, and they did back when I was pastoring. I didn't know anything about it. But we begin to reach people for Christ, and we begin to grow, and God began to change lives. And, and I found out later on that the people in that satanic church asked Satan to attack us. And one night, you remember this story, I was closing up. I had been studying for a sermon at church, or, and I, we lived in the parsonage next door. I was locking the door, and footsteps came running at me, but no one was there. And you've heard me say, being the godly man that I am, what did I do? I ran like crazy. Ran home and told my wife, and that began a three-month period of a satanic attack upon that church. And, and doors opening and closing and nobody being there and flinging back and forth and footsteps in the hallway and people hearing noises and 
one day I found a lady in all black behind the church praying, I think, against the church. And, and it hindered our outreach for about three months. It served a purpose that those people wanted. Our outreach stopped because we had to deal with this satanic attack and a great oppression. I say that to you. There's a lot more involved in that. And I'm not going to tell you the rest of it. You don't need to hear it. I said not to impress you. I ran. Uh, then I, once I got home, I decided, wait a minute, this is God's church. Satan has no business being in there, and we begin the battle against it, praying for three months to try to end that. I say not to impress you. I say it not to scare you, but to say that it, it's a very real battle. And you know what? You will never face that more than likely. You will never face that type of experience in your life, but you will experience a conflict with Satan daily. Now, some people don't believe that such a battle with Satan exists. They, they think it's make-believe. I, I know people that have said that. They believe Satan's just that little red character uh, in that dragon type of costume, and he is called a dragon in the Scripture, but they believe he's just a cartoon character, and, and they are so wrong in that. Other people believe that Satan does exist, but, and that battle takes place, but it, it's not here in the United States. Um, at the time that that satanic attack began on that church there in, in Valley View, Ohio, I was meeting weekly with a group of pastors. Uh, we, most of us had come out of the same mother church that started our churches, not the one I was at, but some others. And uh, Anyways, we met weekly to play basketball together, fellowship, talk about the ministry, and I remember going to them and saying one Friday afternoon, hey, this is what I'm facing. I told them about the footsteps, told them about the doors opening and closing and all the things going on, and they laughed at me. Now, the head of my board laughed at me as well when I made, allowed the church to know what was happening, but you know what? I, I can see him laughing. I, I mean that because he, he was not grounded in the Scripture enough to understand this battle. But for these seven pastors that, one, were friends of mine, and two, were in the ministry together and had studied seminary and studied Satan, I, that's the last thing I expected from them. What was interesting was over the next years, one by one, they began to call me and ask me about how I handled it because they began having it in their churches. And the one who laughed at me the most uh, about a year after I told him about the satanic attack upon my church there, he called me up and he said, Larry, I'm sorry, I laughed at you. He said, but I'm having it in my church now. What did you do? And I, I had to learn on the run, believe me. You know, seminary teaches about Satan, but it doesn't teach you how to handle it when doors are opening and closing and no one's there. And I, you know, and I would share with them and, and just forgive them for, you know, their laughter and, and all that. In fact, what was interesting is just a couple years back, one of those men called me up and he said, Larry, I remember back, I mean, it was 30 some years ago that you had that and you shared that experience. And he said, Larry, I'm having it in my home. What did you do? And, and help me to understand it. And I say out to say, you know what? They found out that it's a very real experience. Satan is real. So other bel believers think, and, and maybe some of you will think that tonight, if I leave Satan alone, he'll leave me alone. You know what? If, if, I, don't have, if I don't hear about him, and if I don't you know, have a pastor on a Wednesday night talking about him, you know what? I don't have to deal with him, and he will leave me alone. What's wrong with that? It's not true, is it? It's not true. It, it's a, uh, it doesn't matter. You may pretend he's not there, and you may say, if, you know, if I put my fingers in my ear, I don't have to hear Pastor Larry tonight. You know, I won't have to deal with it. But you know what? You're going to experience it whether you focus upon it or not. Where did that thought come from? What thought? Well, it came from... It came from, you, you want to say Satan, it probably did, but it's also people are just, people have that mindset, if I don't have to, if I don't learn about it, if I don't think about it, then you know what, I don't have to deal with it. It's, it's just interesting. I've had people tell me that over the years. You know, if, if I don't think about it, if I don't learn about it, then you know what, I don't have to deal with it, and Satan will leave me alone. It's not true. It, it, it certainly isn't true. Did you cast him out in the name of Jesus? I'm not going to go into what we did. We prayed through that church. I had a man, uh, a man in the area who was a good friend of mine, and I, I said, Bill, his name was Bill, I said, Bill, tell me what's happening. He said, Larry, what I found is when you deal with it in the church, within three days you'll have it in your home, and within three days, I woke up in the middle of summer, it was freezing cold in my house. 
and Satan had appeared to my sons in that house. Scare them to death. So we just prayed over the house then, we prayed over the church, but it took three months until it ended, and I don't want to go into that. I, I really don't. Um, because it will scare people, and I don't want to do that. But my purpose, I think, if we can understand this battle and understand our enemy, we can be ready for it. And that's my purpose over the next few weeks, to examine this battle, to understand who our enemy is, his tactics that he uses against us, and to stand firm against him. Because Ephesians 6.11, as we're going to read in just a moment, says, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We don't run from Satan. We run from temptation. We flee temptation, but we stand firm against the devil. And so that's going to be our purpose. And I believe that we as believers struggle many times in, in living the life that God has called us to live and standing firm in this battle because we don't understand this battle. I think sometimes we underestimate this battle and sometimes we overestimate it. I, I think sometimes Satan gets credit for things that he, he, it's not his fault. It's us. But I think sometimes we underestimate this battle and we don't give Satan the credit that he deserves. With that in mind on your outline, join me in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and with all prayer and, and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints." there's the battle, and we're going to work our way in the coming weeks through most of this portion of Scripture and understanding it. But before we get there, I want to start with A on your outline. I want us to see the enemy in this conflict. And I think the Bible is clear that enemy is Satan. There's no question about the enemy in our spiritual conflict. The name Satan, and we'll get to it next time we meet, but it's mentioned 52 times in the Bible. And it's a name that refers to him as being the adversary. Now, the Israelites, in their battle, knew exactly who their enemy was. It was Amalek. There was no question about it. Just as no, there's no question in our battle who our enemy is, is Satan. The difference is, is that the Israelites could see their enemy, Amalek, and see their army. And, and the difference is our spiritual battle that we have with Satan, many times we cannot see. We may at times, but other times, you know what? You, you, you don't see that battle. But it's very clear here who our enemy is, and it's Satan. He opposes God, and he opposes us. Now, what I thought we would do tonight for a little while is look at him. And so let's begin with his fall. Go with me back to Isaiah chapter 14, if you will. Isaiah chapter 14, and in Isaiah 14, as well as in the passage in Ezekiel that we're not going to look at tonight, I don't think, people have different ideas. Some people believe that these just deal with an earthly king. Some uh, would say that they deal with an earthly king as well as Satan, and, and I take that view. I, I think it's both, and, and I think the focus here, I, I think it's a very clear picture here in Isaiah 14, of Satan and his fall. And, and I think if we're going to understand our battle, maybe it'll help us to understand his fall. So look with me there, Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. 
Satan originally was created as Lucifer. The name Lucifer refers to him as the shining one. In verse 12 here is referred to as the morning star or the sun of the morning. He was created in, in Ezekiel 28 tells us, in perfect, he was perfect in his beauty and perfect in his wisdom as far as a creative being could be. I want to make sure we understand. He's not God. He doesn't come near to God, but he was created by God to be beautiful and created by God with perfect wisdom, if you will, as far as a created being could have. And he was created by God, originally created by God as the anointed cherub. Ezekiel 28 tells us that. He's the anointed cherub. A cherubim are the highest order of angels, if you will. They, they seem to have the responsibility uh, of guarding the, the presence of God and guarding his throne and his holiness. That's what the cherubim are, and he's the chief of them. What's interesting is when Abney fell and, and God kicked him out of the garden and, and he, he said they, he put a, a cherubim in front of the tree there in the middle that they could not eat of. You remember that? A cherubim. Isn't it interesting? Satan is the chief of the cherubim, and, and yet when he leads them to, when he leads them, Adam and Eve, to fall and the sin against God, it, it's one of those that he had been over who's placed there to keep Adam and Eve from eating of that tree. Lucifer was the chief of the cherubim. I, I just want us to understand a little bit about him which means perhaps that he himself had the special privilege of guarding God's throne and God's presence. He would have had the other cherubim underneath him, and, and, and he would have led them in the worship of God. He would have been over the angels, so much so that he was a special creation of God. Ezekiel 28, 15 describes him as being blameless in his ways. Blameless means he's completely sound. That's what it means. It means a total moral integrity as far as a created being could have. He was beautiful. He was wise. He was morally blameless. And before his fall, he had free access to the throne of God free to come before the, the very presence of God. And perhaps it was that at the throne of God that this beautiful, wise, morally blameless cherubim, perhaps it was at the throne of God that Lucifer saw one greater than himself. As beautiful and as wise and as morally sound as he was when he came into the presence of God, he had to be overcome by the perfection of God. And he saw one that was so much greater than he was. He saw how far below God he was that as he came in, into the presence of God, he, he saw one that was more majestic than he was, one that was more powerful than he was, one that had perfect wisdom, one who was sovereign over the universe. And I think suddenly at the throne of God, he is struck by the reality of how far below God he was. And Ezekiel 28, 17, talking about him says, your heart was lifted up, lifted up with pride against the God of the universe. And here in Isaiah 14, we have, I think, a description of his rebellion. There are five I statements attributed to him here, beginning in, verse, in verses 13 and 14. And I just want to cover these briefly, not in depth, but just cover these briefly so we get an idea of, of his rebellion. First of all, these aren't on your outline, by the way, but uh, verse 13, it says, But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will ascend to heaven. While Satan had access to heaven, he desired to occupy heaven on equality with God. I, I think that's what he's saying here. Even though he was allowed to have access into heaven, he, he, he wanted to be equal with God in heaven. Secondly, here in verse 13, 
he says, I, I will raise up my throne above the stars of God. Now, the word stars there can mean two different things. Uh, on the one hand, it, it often in Scripture refers to angels. The angels are called stars many times. And, and it seems here that, that if he's going to raise his throne above the stars, and he, he desired to rule over the angels. And you say, yeah, but he, he always, already was their leader. And he was, but not like God. Because he had to go to the angels and say, this is what God says. This is what God has ordered. And, and he had to lead them in the worship of God. And so as he's dealing with the angels who are under him, it was always in the sense of being one lower than God and always passing on what God wanted and who God was. And so now he wants to be the one who determines what the angels do. He wants the angels to do his bidding instead of God's bidding. You see the difference there? And that's if the stars, we're going to come back to the pride. I'm going to ask you about that in just a few moments. That's if the stars there in verse 13 mean angels. Some have said that stars there can refer to the heavenly bodies. And if that's the case, then here in verse 13, Satan desires to rule in the heavens. He wants to rule in the heavens, and that goes along with the third thing he says here in verse 13 when he says, I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. The sense there in that phrase, the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north, that's where the people believe that the gods ruled, if you will, where the universe was ruled from. And if that's the case, then Satan is saying here that he desired to govern the universe. Instead of God, do you sense what's happening in him? Fourthly, in verse 14, we have another I statement from him. He says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Clouds in the scripture are often associated with God's presence. For example, in Exodus 16 and verse 10 and Isaiah 19 and verse 1, it, it, it talks about the cloud. It, it associates the clouds with the very presence and the glory of God. And if that's the case, then Satan here in verse 14 is indicating he wanted the glory that God possessed. He saw the glory of God. And he wanted that. Finally, in verse 14, he says, I will make myself like the Most High God. He wanted to be like God. Not unlike God, but like God. He wanted the power that God possessed. He wanted the authority that God had. He wanted the glory that God had. He wanted to be like God. He, he wanted the worship that God received to come to him. And he wanted the position that God possessed. And so he rebels against God, and he led one-third of the angels to join him in that rebellion. Now, a result of that rebellion, and I'm going to give you some time here in just a few moments to make your comments. Some things happen. One result of that rebellion, he's, he, he's cast out of heaven. Ezekiel 28, as well as Christ, talks about that in the New Testament. And before his rebellion, as he served before the throne of God, he had free access to the throne of God and the presence of God. But now, after his fall, he can only come in as a visitor to the very throne of God. He can only come into the presence of God by the permission of God. Secondly, he also lost his position before God. And he became Satan, the adversary of God and our adversary. It's quite a change, isn't it? For Satan, quite, I mean, it's a quite a change from what he had and where he was before his fall till after his fall, his rebellion. The question we need to stop and ask, and I want to ask you tonight, how could he do it? How could he rebel against God like that? With, well, hold on. With such a privileged position before God and knowing the glory and the holiness of God, and knowing that God alone is the God of the universe, that he reigns sovereign over it, and that he, Satan, was just a created, limited, limited being, 
knowing all that, how could Satan do it? How could he rebel against God? Hold on, because I want us to think about some things. There is no devil yet to tempt them to rebel. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, people say, it, it was the devil. He tempted me to do it. But there's no devil in that sense yet to tempt Satan to do it. Knowing that, there's no sin in the world to lure him to rebel against God. People have different ideas about when he rebelled and felt, I believe he did it after creation. Some people believe he did it before creation. I believe he did it after the seventh day of creation. And the reason I believe that is if you read the account of creation in Genesis, it says at the end of every day, the first six days of creation, it says, and God looked at everything that he had created, and behold, it was good. And in Hebrew, it reads very, very, very good. It was perfect. Everything was perfect, just the way God desired it to be. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And his creation, I believe, was perfect, including Satan at that time. So I'm going to ask you, how could such an evil, such evil rise in this angelic being who had such privilege before God? How could it happen? What do you? Pride. His pride deluded him into thinking that he could be God or be above God or appropriate all of his attributes and become who God is. It was, pride was the source of it. Pride was the source. And we're going to hit that pride in just a couple of minutes. What else? Tom. He, wanted, he saw the power, and he wanted to have the power. Okay. He saw the power, and he wanted to have that power. Kathy's right beside you. I, I think maybe he was deceived because he was just looking at himself and what he wanted. Okay, hold on to that. Would you hold on to that? Uh, hold on to that thought. I don't think he was deceived. He's the deceiver. But hold on to that. He was looking at himself. Is that okay? I'll come back to you. I promise. Ken? Free will. Thank you. Just because he chose to. Because God allowed him the freedom to make that choice. And so he chose to rebel. Just like we do. Just like we choose to rebel against God. Now, was God surprised by it all? No, he's omniscient. He's perfect knowledge, and he's also sovereign, and nothing can happen outside of his will. But Satan chose to rebel against God. It's a choice he made. He had everything <laughs> any angel could ever want, and but he chose to do it, just as you and I choose to rebel against God. We don't like to think of ourselves as rebelling against God, do we? But don't we rebel against God? Every time we sin... We rebel against God, don't we? Kathy, had, I think you had something, didn't you? That's okay. We'll come back to you because I saw another hand somewhere. Or do you know? Do you know what you want to say? He, tonight, Tom Erder said to me the word joy. He said, joy is Jesus first, others next, and everyone else last. Yeah. And when we put Jesus, in a, or the Lord, in any other position than yeah. on first, then you're going to be sinning, and yeah. you're going to be We're. caught up in your own selfishness, We're. your own pride, and pride goeth before a fall. It does, and we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Somebody else have the hand up? I thought I saw no hand. Aubrey. In the, I'm sorry? <laughs> he was, yeah. And, and we were talking about that. I mean, God is sovereign, but he's also created with a free will, and he chose to do it, just as we do. He does. Good point. You're going to wear that, that boy out. <laughs> well, some of you have mentioned his pride, and it was his pride that led him to rebel against God. 
and, and Satan to this very moment continues to pridefully rebel against God, knowing his ultimate end. And he's going to seek to get us to do the same thing, rebel against God be, through our pride. He's going to use pride to accomplish it. So some of you already started, Kathy, and Kathy, I think, have talked about it. Why is such pride such a, a big deal? Why is pride such a big deal? And, and it's at the foundation, I would say, of every sin. At the foundation of every sin is pride and a rebellion against God. So why is pride such a big deal? Why do we struggle with it? And how, do we, how does pride come out in us? That's a lot of questions. Okay, so it's, it's putting ourselves first is, is a sense of pride, and you were talking about that, which Satan did, didn't he? I, remember the eyes, I, 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 five times I. So yes, it's putting ourselves first. Kathy, do you want to come back now? Or? I was just thinking too, this same thing happens today um, where a, 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 I call them demon-possessed human beings who have taken the, have given their soul to Satan and they are, they are living that way. Um, they, will, they will tell you something that is not real, but they will force you to believe it. And I think Satan was um, uh, somewhat similar in that he, uh, he was filled up with his desire and refused to look beyond him. He wanted to be top dog. Yeah, he, he wanted to be a top. It was his desire, and that's all that mattered. Good. Aubrey? I think the eye gate. I think the eye gate. Everything he saw, he saw, he saw God getting worship. He saw God this. He saw, he saw, he saw. And the eye gate blinded him because he's so captivated by the, what he saw and experienced through the eye gate. But he misjudged God in the process of that. What, why wouldn't he be captivated? I mean, he, he's beautiful in his appearance. He's all wisdom. He, he, he's morally sound. He, he's the head of the cherubim. He's at the very throne of God. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. He's, he, again, he sees everything to eye gate, and, and it's captivated him in such a way, like, ah, I could do this. I could. But it's, it's all what he saw. If he was blind, probably he wouldn't, remember, he, he wouldn't have had that same response. But he wasn't blind. He saw, and that overwhelmed him. I think you're right. I think he saw very clearly. He wasn't blinded as much as he comes into the presence of God and, and sees as beautiful and as wise as he is and the, the power and, and everything that he was, he sees one who is greater than him. And pride says, man, I've got to have that for me. I was thinking, um, so Satan looked at everything they had being um, in charge of all of them, and he wanted more. He wanted the power. I think you're right. He wanted more. He did. But who else wants more? We do. We do. We're, we can't be content with what God has given to us or the position he's given to us or the, the, how he supplied our needs. We, we always want more. You know, we focus upon ourselves and we want to be important. Nothing wrong with feeling good about ourselves. He created us. I mean, we're, our worth and values tap to who we are before God, but we, 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 we find a sense of importance. I've got to be successful. I've got to have this. Nothing wrong with success. Don't get me wrong. But when that becomes a focus of our lives, then we lose track of who we are before God. Kathy, go ahead. Are you talking about believers, or are you speaking yes, about? Yes, I'm talking about believers. No. No, I think I Satan influences believers. I think anyone who has given their life to Jesus Christ, they can't be possessed, but they can certainly be influenced. Look at Acts chapter five with Ananias and Sapphira. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I watched the believer in the midst of that church have her eyes roll up into the top of her head. Influenced by Satan, we had to do a church discipline. And Deb, couldn't you also say it's we're it's in our nature? It's a human desire. It is. It's in our DNA. 
we're born with it, aren't we? Aren't we? Mm -hmm. and, and we got it from our parents, and, and they got it from their parents. It's that, you know, that desire self. It's a focus upon self. A baby comes out of the womb, and as precious as they are, I want. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I have a dirty diaper or whatever. There's a focus upon self in our lives, just like Satan in many ways. We've learned well from him, haven't we? Interesting. Go ahead, back there, please. So I think you said it, I, you know, right, I agree with you, that it happened after the creation. Um, before, you know, say, angels were made to be messengers of God, and once God created man in his image, it was jealousy also with pride. Pride has been trying to take man down ever since. The angels rejoiced at creation. And maybe when, they, when, when Lucifer saw mankind, and maybe he was jealous, I don't know. He's jealous of God, certainly. Interesting. Aubrey, all right. Title, but not in the ministry God had given him to do. He fell in love with his title, his position. He fell in love with what? In love with his title, his position. His position as title. He fell in love with it, but he was supposed to fall in love with, with the ministry God had given him in serving God. But he yeah. did the opposite of that. Yeah, God had given him that beauty, that wisdom, power, everything that he had to serve God and fulfill his purpose. He took what God had given to him and used it for himself. One more, and then we'll get going looking at the names. Go ahead, one more, right back there. I'm sorry, I didn't know you had it. We'll go to. I think that uh, Satan wants to take our teens away. Take our what? Our, our Christian teens. I think that he's so greedy that he wants to bring them on his side <laughs> and he's going to fight more for that so that way he can take down the church he wants to take us all away down the wrong path go ahead um, so I'm just a little confused on like I understand what you were saying about <clears throat> like a baby is inherently born with a sin, sin because of the fall um, but if God created the earth or it created the universe, created the earth, everything in it, and it was perfect, and he created Satan, and he was, or Lucifer, and he was perfect, but he had pride inside of him. Would that mean, I'm just confused as to, like, is that quality that was in Lucifer originally good, or was it, have we always just had that ability to choose to rebel or I, that, I'm just yes I, yes and yes because God allows us to be to have a free will to choose you and I will choose tomorrow whether we're going to walk in obedience to God how we're going to treat people what we're going to say how we're going to drive oh, better stay off of that one huh um, pride isn't bad there's nothing wrong with having a sense of pride in a good sense of of having a worth and a value if that's what we mean by pride and who God created us and who we are before him Nothing wrong with that. I, I think it's wrong to tell a child he shouldn't have a sense of worth and value. But what happens, I think, with Satan is he took, as Aubrey, I think, was saying, the good things that God had given to him, and, and he, he made evil out of it. He took that good pride, and it became a pridefulness, an evil sin, just as we do. We ought to feel a sense of worth and value in who we are before God, but, but we take that good sense and we... We, we turn it into an evil. You know, I've got to have this. I've got to do this. I, I need people to recognize me. I, 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 a number of things. Nothing wrong with being successful in life, is there? But when that becomes the driving force in everything we do and not honoring God, then it's, it's an evil then. Go ahead, and then we're gone. <laughs> black never looks blacker than it does against a white backdrop. And we need contrast to appreciate what God's given us. Yeah, and without the contrast, we'd be we'd be wandering around without a rudder. So, so I I think what start, from that perspective, n knowing the good versus evil gives us a basis. We have a, a frame of reference, and we're supposed to be intelligent and use our free choice. We are supposed to, to be pick intelligent. and choose, and, and use it wisely, and choose to live a life that's honoring and pleasing to God every moment. But sadly, I mean. 
First John chapter 1, verse 8, John says we all sin. We say we do, if we say we do not, he's writing to believers. If we say we do not sin, we, we know we deceive ourselves. Paul would say he's a chief of sinners. Was he talking about before salvation? Yes, but he also would say, a oh, wretched man that I am. So I think you're right. I, 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 we under, if we can see this, and we're going to get to that, if we can see the sin and we can see the change that God makes in us, the new life, which if I get to it before the Lord's table, we're going to see. It's not you. It's Hold on. And, and let me go on because what I want us to do is begin to understand this enemy and, and, and some of his titles, and I'm not going to get very far. But I do want to cover one of his titles tonight, so let me do just a couple of these, and then we'll, we'll look at a, a third title. Let's look at his names because names in the Bible and titles and references tell you a great deal about the person. And, and it's true with Satan. And, and if we can look at some of his names, some of his titles, some of the references to him, then we can understand who he is and how he functions and what he's all about. You know, I, I've heard it said that if you're going to go into battle, you better know who your enemy is and know everything about them that you can because then you can fight that enemy better, and I think that's true with Satan. So let's understand his names. They're number three on your outline. He's called by different names or titles, like in John chapter 12, verse 31, it, it, he's called the ruler of the world. The word ruler there is, is, means a prince or one who rules. It's an officer. And the concept of the world there, it, it, it's, it's speaking about the, the cosmos or the, the world order, if you will. How this world is organized and it says that he's the ruler of this world now i said that the world word word world means a sense of order i mean it's referring to the order in this world when we look at this world we see this world as being chaos don't we i mean it just looks so crazy it looks so chaotic but not really. It really isn't. Because if, if Satan is the ruler of this world, then he is ordering this world according to his will and, and his order. He's making it exactly how he wants it to be, under the sovereignty of God. And by the way, I'm going to keep going back to that because I don't want us walking away tonight or any night saying, you know what? Satan is on an equal basis with God or Satan's in charge. No, he's not. God is sovereign. But he is allowing Satan for a little while to be the ruler of this world and to organize this world the way he desires. And Satan's world order, as we see in our world right now, functions apart from God. So that this world we live in, instead of seeking God's will, it seeks Satan's will. I mean, I'm 68 years old, and I look at this world and... I see how it's changed so much, and I, how evil it is. And I ask, how can it be this way? I mean, how did all this happen? And it's right here, because behind it all is Satan as a ruler of this world accomplishing his will. He's a ruler of this world. He's making it the way he wants it to be. Um, can I skip B, and I'll come back to B next time, Okay. And I'm going to skip C. <laughs> Stay with me. Because I want to lead into the Lord's table with this. I, I thought I'd get quite a bit through tonight, and I'm not. Do you see D on your outline there uh, under his names? The devil, the slander. Do you know where I'm at? All right. The name devil, as he's called in Scripture, it means the slanderer. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1 is talking about the temptation of Jesus, and it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And we're going to come to his temptation later on, but here in Matthew 4 and verse 1, Satan is called the devil. And the word devil is a word that means the accuser, the slanderer. And that's what Satan is. He's a, yeah, he's a ruler of this world, and he's making this world the way he wants it to be. But he's also the slanderer, 
the accuser. He, he, he slanders God. And I was going to take us back to Genesis chapter 3 and remember when in the garden when he comes to Eve and he says, Eve, has God said you shall not eat of any of the trees in the garden? Is that what God said? No, God said you can have any of the trees. You can eat from any of the fruit except for this one. And if you eat this one, you're going to die. And Satan says, Eve, did God say you can't eat of any of the trees here? And then he says, Eve, God knows that if you eat of this tree, you're going to become like God. Do you see how he slanders God? He, he, he takes the very word of God and he changes it and slanders God. Oh, God's a bad God. I mean, if he was a good God, he would want you eating from that tree. He would want you being all wise. He would want you to be a God. So he, he slanders God. Secondly, as the devil, he accuses us. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 says, For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before God day and night. Now, I think it's dealing with the tribulation saints, but it's also us. Satan there, it says, accuses us before God. Satan before God says, God, look at Larry Bennett. He, he's a sinner and he deserves your judgment. And I do. But Satan appears before God and, and he accuses us. In fact, it says there he accuses us before God day and night. Day and night means he does it constantly. It's interesting there. So he accuses us before God. But Satan also accuses you and I to ourselves. He accuses us with a sense of guilt. By the way, isn't it interesting? The very one who leads us into sin then uses that sin to accuse us. And, and he says to you and to me, look at yourself. You call yourself a Christian? Think about what you just said, what you just did. And he beats us down with that sense of guilt. And I think that's what happened to Peter the night that he denied Christ. Because after he denied Christ, he went away weeping. The word weeping there isn't just a few tears. Peter is a broken man. His heart is broken. And I think Satan just poured it on him that night. So Satan is a, a slanderer. He's an accuser. By the way, before we leave this, to gossip or to slander is to put someone else in a negative light to someone, even if it's true. And gossip and slander are the acceptable sin in Christianity. I just want you to know so you'd be praying for this person. I just think you ought to know what's happening in their life. It's called intercessory gossip, yeah. It's also called slander. And who's the one behind all the gossip and slander? Satan is. I wonder if we realize that, if we would, next time we go to gossip or put slander or put someone down to someone else, if we would think, this is from the devil. This is not of God. I'm not patient. What do you think of him as the accuser? I've already given you two names. You've got about a minute to tell me. What do you think of him as the God of this world and the accuser, the slanderer? I'm sorry? Powerful, isn't it? It's false. It is false. Sort of. And I'll get to that when we have the Lord's table. I'm going to ask the gentleman, it's kind of rough tonight, and I apologize, but if our deacons can go prepare the elements, and while you're doing that, let me skip in my notes and, and come. I want to prepare our hearts for just a moment before we have the Lord's table. And let me read to you again Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. 
For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before our God day and night. So Satan accuses us constantly before God. And he declares our sin. And you know, he has grounds to do that. Why? Because we are sinners. He has grounds to accuse us before, before God because Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have and we all do. So Satan is right in that, in that we are sinners, and he's right in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. Judgment from God. And Satan is right in that he can appear before God and he can say, you know what? They are sinners and they deserve your judgment. They deserve your wrath. But let me read to you 1 John chapter 2 very quickly. In verses 1 and 2. John writes, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And, and so you have to have the picture here. The word advocate is a word that means one who comes to the person's side or comes to help them or pleads their cause. So as Satan stands before God and he says, you know what, they deserve your judgment. They are sinners and, and according to your word, they deserve your judgment, your wrath. And, and he is right except that Christ, our advocate, stands up and says, wait a minute. I died with those sins. I paid the price. In fact, in verse 2, it says he's a propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means a, a sin offering, an atoning sacrifice, and Christ stands in our stead, and he says, you know what? I paid it all. I took all of their sin, all the judgment and the wrath that they deserve, and I took it upon me. And Satan has no grounds because the penalty's been paid. See, tonight at the Lord's table, we often think that we are just celebrating the forgiveness of our sins, eternal life with God, brought into a right relationship with God, and we are. But tonight we are also celebrating our advocate who is in heaven right now pleading our cause and saying, I died with their sins. I don't know about you, but I think 